nuclear bombs, weapons of mass destruction. But what if these weapons could also be used to dig a new Suez Canal? That's what the US was working on at the end of the 1960s. More than 600 nukes all lined up in a row. Press the detonate button and instantly excavate 200 kilometers of Earth. Hey, I'm your host Regis, and today we'll be looking at the insanity of Project Plowshare. Let me say it again, 600 nukes. What could possibly go wrong? Just picture the scene, a stretch of sand and mountains right at the heart of New Mexico. It's the last few minutes before sunrise, and the moon hangs low in the sky. Suddenly, the landscape is flooded by a rush of bright, terrible light. It fades to reveal a ball of flame. Then a shockwave like wind and thunder. This is what happened at Trinity, the first test detonation of a nuclear bomb in all of human history. In the words of J. Robert Oppenheimer, the physicist in charge of this entire event, He knew the world would not be the same. You probably know what happened next. Just a few weeks after the Trinity test, the U.S. dropped a pair of these bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The two explosions killed approximately 200,000 Japanese civilians, cursed many more to long-term side effects, and caused Japan to surrender the war two weeks later, bringing an end to World War II. Now, maybe that should have been the end of the nuclear story. But now that America had unlocked the atom, there was more that they wanted to do with it. In the next few years, they developed smaller, more efficient, more powerful bombs. And here's the thing, they didn't just see them as weapons. In 1953, eight years after the Trinity test, the US President Dwight D. Eisenhower gave a speech to the United Nations. Atoms for Peace, as this speech became known, put forward a bold idea. What if the power of nuclear bombs could be harnessed as a force for good? This greatest of destructive forces can be developed into a great boom for the benefit of all mankind. Off the back of this speech, a conference was held at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, a California facility which specialized in nuclear research. At this conference, a group of leading scientists asked a massive question. Could nuclear weapons be used as a tool for cheap, large-scale excavation? The idea of using explosives for excavation wasn't exactly new. Since the 1600s, black powder had been used to dig mines and loosen ore deposits. More recently, at the end of the 19th century, dynamite had brought things up a notch. But even dynamite didn't come anywhere near the power of modern nuclear bombs. Enormous energy, relatively inexpensive, compact and easily transportable. This is the new power tool that Plowshare would add to man's resources of useful energy, to do jobs never before practical or even possible. Now, as per usual, there was a catch. Everyone knew that these bombs were powerful, but nobody actually knew what would happen if you used one to clear Earth. For the excavation to properly work, the bomb would need to be detonated underground, and that had never really been tested before. Trinity, for example, had used a bomb suspended at the top of a 30-meter tower. That's a totally different set of conditions compared to a bomb positioned underground. So what did those scientists decide to do? Well, to set up another test. In 1957, a tunnel was dug into the side of a mountain in Nevada. The tunnel was 500 meters long and led to a point at the center of the mountain, about 270 meters below the surface. Here, they placed a nuclear bomb, and then they pressed the detonator button. Now, before we see what happened, a quick note on explosive force. We can measure the force of a nuclear bomb in terms of kilotons. One kiloton is the equivalent explosive force of a thousand tons of TNT. The most powerful nuclear bombs at the time had a force of more than 10,000 kilotons. The bomb at Trinity had a force of 18.6 kilotons. But this underground bomb? Only 1.7 kilotons. Now, that's still a big payload, but relatively speaking, these scientists were playing it safe. They didn't want to blow up the entire mountain. They just wanted to carve out a chunk of it. And when the bomb went off, that's exactly what it did. The explosion carved out a spherical hole about 40 meters across. This hole held its shape for a second or two before the rock above it collapsed. This left behind a chimney-like structure full of rubble, more than 700,000 tons of rock piled 200 meters tall. 
Now, to put that into perspective, if you'd cleared out the rubble, the hole itself would have been large enough to fit a decent-sized skyscraper. As far as excavation went, that was a pretty big success. And there was a little bonus, too. On the surface, above the bomb site, the explosion shook up a cloud of dust and left a bit of a sinkhole. But apart from that, it didn't really leave a mark. All the dangerous radioactive material, which always filled the atmosphere after overground explosions, had been totally contained within the rock. This was seen as a pretty major win by the scientists at Lawrence Livermore. A humongous hole with contained radiation? What was there not to love? The hole itself, of course, was a hazard zone. It took 15 months for the radiation to decay to a manageable level, but this wasn't really seen as a problem. If you could excavate a hole as large as this one, waiting a year to actually use it didn't feel like the end of the world. And so, in June of 1958, half a year or so after this initial test, an official program was launched to explore these ideas even further. To test a few more underground bombs, then to put these techniques into practice. Nuclear excavation had the potential to transform construction and engineering forever, digging out harbors, reservoirs, tunnels, canals, mines, and much more. These and other massive, imaginative, earth-moving projects may soon be ours, created in seconds with the tremendous energy of the peaceful atom. And so, the program became known as Project Plowshare. A reference to a quote in the Bible, they shall beat their swords into plowshares. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. The next big test of Project Plowshare was in 1961. Project Gnome, as they called it, used a three kiloton bomb, about twice as powerful as that original test in Nevada. It created another massive hole, but this time there was a bit of a catch. Some radioactive steam leaked out up into the atmosphere above the test site. It wasn't anything major, but it was something to be aware of. These detonations don't always turn out perfectly. Plowshare pushed on with more tests. In 1962, they decided to try an underground detonation of a massive bomb with a payload of 104 kilotons. In other words, it was more than 30 times stronger than the bomb used for Project Gnome. This time, well, the explosion was so big that it blew open the Earth and spouted clouds of radioactive material. It's hard to know how much exactly, but it's believed that the fallout affected a higher number of U.S. residents than any other nuclear test. Project Sedan, as this test became known, also left behind the largest man-made crater in the whole of the United States. You can even see it now on Google Maps or pay the site a visit in person. From an excavation perspective, Project Sedan was another success story. In theory, it would have taken six whole months to build an equivalent crater using traditional methods like TNT explosives and diggers. But given the risk of more nuclear fallout, Plowshare decided to tone things back and return to slightly smaller bombs. The next big experiment was Project Buggy, which attempted to dig a giant ditch by lining up five nuclear bombs in a row. Each of these bombs had a payload of 1.1 kilotons, and the test worked wonders. The bombs dug an instant ditch, which was about 100 meters wide, 300 meters long, and 25 meters deep. Again, you can actually see this instant ditch if you open Google Maps. At first glance, it looks as though these bombs must have detonated fairly close to the surface. But actually, they were buried about 50 meters underground. Essentially, each bomb made an underground hole, which then collapsed in on itself, leaving this ditch-like sinkhole behind. Now, just like Project Gnome, a small amount of radioactive material did manage to leak into the atmosphere, but it was nowhere near as bad as Project Sedan. Now, you might be wondering why the scientists at Plowshare were so interested in digging ditches. Well, it's really quite simple. If you fill up a ditch with water, what do you end up with? A canal. And building canals was important, especially considering what was going on with the Suez Canal at the time. Now, before we dive deep into the insane plan of digging a new Suez Canal with nukes, we quickly want to thank our long-term partner CyberGhost VPN for sponsoring this video. With over 38 million users worldwide, it's one of the most trusted VPNs out there, and it's got a near-perfect rating on Trustpilot, with over 20,000 people rating it as excellent. So let us quickly tell you why CyberGhost is such a great choice. A VPN is essential for protecting your digital privacy, and if you think you're already covered because you only browse in incognito mode, think again. Plenty of eyes are watching you every single time you go online. 
And incognito mode really only gives you a false sense of privacy. Your internet service provider, your school or work's IT department, even your own home Wi-Fi router, they can all track what you do online. To put a stop to this invasion of privacy, what you need is CyberGhost VPN. Just turn on CyberGhost VPN before you browse, and it encrypts and reroutes 100% of your traffic through their secure servers, so no one will even know about your online activity. It's all really simple, and CyberGhost has servers in over 100 countries ready to cater to your every need. CyberGhost also unlocks geo-restricted content from over 40 streaming platforms like Netflix, Amazon Prime, and Disney+. Plus. You can even score better deals online or unlock games that are blocked in your region by simply changing your virtual location. CyberGhost works on all major devices and operating systems. Windows, Mac OS, Android, iOS, and you can protect up to seven devices at the same time. It's perfect for sharing with friends and family. And don't worry, they don't keep any logs of what you do online. Even they won't know. With our link, cyberghostvpn.com slash megabuilds, you get their best deal ever. Just $2.03 a month, plus four months free, which is a whopping 84% off. There's also a 45-day money-back guarantee, so you have nothing to lose. It's a great product, we can definitely recommend it, and by signing up using our link in the description, you also help us to create high-quality videos like this one. Thank you again to CyberGhost VPN, and now, back to the Suez Canal. You've probably heard of Suez. It's one of the most famous and politically turbulent bodies of water in the world. It was originally built way back in the 19th century, when France decided to cut through Egypt and connect the Red Sea to the Mediterranean. The Suez Canal became a massive shortcut for ships that wanted to travel between Europe and Asia. Historically, a ship going from Asia to Europe had to travel all the way around Africa, a distance of about 20,000 kilometers. For a larger ship, like an oil tanker, that journey could take almost a month. But the Suez Canal almost halved that journey. And the canal itself was less than 200 kilometers long. For about 100 years, the canal was owned by Europeans. Not just by France, but Britain as well. And by the 1950s, more than 10,000 container ships were using the canal every year. It was especially important for oil tankers. About two-thirds of all the oil used by Europe got there via the canal. So it was a pretty big deal when Egypt decided to claim the canal in 1956 and kick out the French and the British. Now, to be fair to the Egyptians, it was on their land. At least, it was on their land until 1967, when Israel swept in and took control of this territory right here. See? We told you Suez was politically unstable. Now, Egypt managed to hold Israel back when they reached the eastern side of the canal. But it became a literal war zone, with shelling on both banks, mines in the water, and Egypt decided to shut it to global trade. This happened so suddenly that 15 cargo ships ended up stranded. They'd been halfway along the Suez Canal before Egypt shut both ends. The canal was closed for eight whole years, while the war between Egypt and Israel raged on. And global trade took a massive hit. According to a study by the UN at the time, the closed canal cost the global economy more than $10 billion. Now, that's closer to $70 billion in today's money. If only there'd been an easy way to build another canal, an alternative route from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean. Well, let's get back to Project Plowshare. So, the Suez Canal was officially closed between 1967 and 1975, and Project Buggy, that line of five bombs in the Nevada desert, took place in 1968. Perfect timing, right? Off the back of these tests, the U.S. started pushing a plan to build a Suez alternative. Now, we'll take a look at that plan in a second, but first, if you're enjoying this video and want to see similar content in the future, don't forget to subscribe to Megabuilds down below. Anyway, back to that plan. America wanted to build their new canal here, through the Negev Desert in Israel. They planned for it to be 250 kilometers long. That's a little bit longer than Suez. It would be built using a series of two kiloton bombs, each one placed at the bottom of a drill hole spaced in 400 meter intervals. In total, that worked out at roughly 600 nuclear bombs. The U.S. calculated that the price of these bombs, plus the work to drill all the holes to put them in, would come in at roughly $260 million. After detonating the bombs, they'd also need to pay for additional engineering, like securing the ditch and installing locks, and generally just transforming it into a usable new canal. That would have brought the cost of the project to $575 million, or just over $5 billion in today's money. 
Now, that may sound like a lot, but traditional methods would have cost significantly more. According to one classified memo on the subject, conventional methods of excavation of this magnitude would have been, quote, prohibitively expensive. And they also would have been just a lot slower. The Suez Canal took 10 years to build. Thousands of workers with steam-powered excavators gradually digging 70 million cubic meters of earth. The nuclear option, on the other hand, could do all that digging in seconds. Okay, so here's the big question. If this plan was feasible and potentially profitable, why did it never happen? Well, at the end of the day, the project was held up by environmental factors. As we've already talked about, while Project Plowshares underground tests had mostly contained any dangerous radiation, small amounts of hazardous material had still escaped into the environment. With one or two bombs, that's not a major issue. But 600? Eh, well, it would start to add up. The project pointed out that the vast majority of the planned canal would be cutting through unpopulated desert, and any parts that came close to populated areas could be built using conventional methods. But even so, the thought of 600 bombs going off at once made a lot of people pretty uneasy. They were also worried about other problems, like would the shockwaves from these nuclear bombs set off landslides and earthquakes? Or how about dust clouds or sandstorms? Detonating 600 bombs at once had never been tested, and the results were really hard to predict. Also, while the price of nuclear bombs was significantly less than conventional methods, $575 million was still a lot of money for the American government to cough up. And the government decided that the cheaper option was just to wait for the original Suez Canal to reopen. So that's exactly what they did. They canceled the project, and in the end, they also decided to cancel Project Plowshare as a whole. Nuclear excavation was just a bit too hazardous, and even though it would have saved some money, it wouldn't have saved enough to properly justify it. The entire program was officially shut down in 1975. Conveniently, that was the exact same year that the Suez Canal reopened. Coincidence? Now, what we haven't had time to talk about is that Russia was also testing their own nuclear bomb excavations at the exact same time as America. And unlike America, they actually managed to build something. So if you'd like us to make a video about that, let us know in the comments down below. And if you want to try CyberGhost VPN, make sure to use our link in the description. CyberGhost VPN will protect your data while you browse and give you full access to all blocked content on the internet. It's a great VPN, just like their current deal for $2.03 a month and 45 days money back guarantee. So it's totally risk-free. As always, thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in the next video.